What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 202 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for October 11th, 2017. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we're not going to waste any time here. Two quick plugs, though. Last week on WrestleRant Radio, you could hear my exclusive interview with James Storm, TNA Superstar. It was a part of the GFW conference call. As I record this later on today, I'll be talking to Gail Kim. So if I can get in a few questions, when sometimes I get one in, sometimes I can get three to four it's all a matter of how many people are a part of the call. I will include those questions and her answers and whatnot as a part of WrestleRant Radio on a future edition. But one last thing before we get started. Speaking of WrestleRant Radio, this past week, we celebrated four years of the show. So anyone who has ever checked out an episode, supported the show, thank you so much. We made it this far. Tomorrow to celebrate, I'm airing my exclusive interview that I recorded just about a week ago, uh, last Wednesday, with WWE superstar Sin Cara, of all people. Yes, he's still at the company. Uh, we're talking Reebok Classic, we're talking Foot Locker, WWE Footwear, Eddie Guerrero, the Cruiserweight division, uh, being a Texas native and so much more. It was a great conversation. I got to talk to him for about 10-15 minutes. So that whole interview will be up in its entirety tomorrow on Wrestle Rant Radio, hoping to have an, an article accompanying that on HiddenRemote.com. So without further ado, guys, let's talk about hashtag AskGSM here today. If you want to send in a question, be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a comment on the post. I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. Last but certainly not least, be sure to drop a comment on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So let's get started here. First question from YouTube from Emmanuel A. I love this question a lot. It's not even wrestling related, which is a weird way to kick off the show today, but uh, I think Emmanuel knows I like this show a lot, even though I have not mentioned it, I'm pretty sure, here on Hashtag. I'm, I'm sure I've tweeted it once or twice, but it's not very well known. I'm a fan of this show. It's only a newfound thing. Anyway, so his question was, have you heard about the Rick and Morty McDonald's incident? To make a long story short, the Rick and Morty fan base got McDonald's to sell Soshwin sauce. I think that's how you pronounce it. I might be wrong. A dipping sauce originally sold during the promotion for Disney's Mulan, which is going back, what, 15, 20 years at this point? However, McDonald's understocked their sauce, which, lead, which led to riots that got police involved. Yes, I did hear about that. The Soshwin sauce became like a running gag um, in Rick and Morty. And before I even talk about that, Rick and Morty is a great fucking show. I retweeted something that Sami Zayn said before his heel turn uh, a couple of days ago, like earlier last week. So he's like, oh, I know I'm late to the party, but Rick and Morty is seriously a great show. And I could not agree more. And I'm in the exact same boat. Uh, Rick and Morty, I think, debuted in 2013. There's been three seasons as of now. The third season just wrapped up like two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Um, but I didn't start watching it until like a few months ago when Jason, who you guys know, he's been on the show multiple times here before on hashtag SGSM. Um, he got me into the show earlier this year. I mean, I'm shocked I didn't already really know about it. I didn't, hadn't even heard of it. I hadn't even heard of the show before he had sent me a few clips of it earlier this year, like back in January and being a big back to the future fan. I'm shocked I never heard of it because it's not really a parody of back to the future, but it is a playoff of Doc and Marty, Rick and Morty, um, but it's a lot more crude humor, and uh, they make fun of themselves, and they break the fourth wall, and they make a lot of great references. It's a great show, and it's really, really entertaining. Um, all the past episodes, at least the first two seasons, are available, I believe, on Hulu+, Plus, and they're all online, too. The third season, like I said, just wrapped up. Um, but I don't watch TV. You guys know that I've talked about that before here on the show. I watched the entire, uh, all eight seasons of House, like a year and a half ago, which was a great show too. But beyond that one, like Craving, I have yet to watch really any other show. I mean, except for Raw and SmackDown and that kind of shit. I mean, I love Psych, but Psych wrapped up a few years ago. And I mentioned that here on the show before as well, that I think Psych is having a reunion Christmas episode in a few months, which I cannot fucking wait for. But anyway, to answer your question, I did hear about that. Uh, my brother told me about it because I saw it, like, trending on Twitter. I saw it, like, literally on, like, AOL.com and websites like that, like, actual news websites talking about this incident. So I had read some sort of update that said they're going to be selling the sauce again, I think, in December, uh, which is pretty funny. I would not wait in a McDonald's line um, for over a day, which is what I heard some people did in order to get the Soshwin sauce. So Rick and Morty had made like a joke about it, that they want the sauce and like an episode from a few years ago. And it became this big cult following among the um, fans of the show. So it became an actual reality at one point, um, just recently, which Emmanuel was referring to. 
They started selling the sauce. They ran out. They underestimated how many people wanted it, which led to riots, which is ridiculous. But they are a faithful bunch. I will say that much. Captain Sunshine from YouTube, their question was, what if the Shield needed a fourth man for TLC and they bring back the Ryback? No one knows the Shield better than Ryback. Other than maybe Kane and Daniel Bryan, who had like a million matches with the Shield between 2012 and uh, 2013. But um, Ryback knows Shield probably better than anyone, which would be pretty nice. I don't think anyone is clamoring for a Ryback return, and I love Ryback, but even I'm not saying, like, oh my god, we need Ryback back right now. But uh, that would be pretty funny. Also considering the fact that Ryback was one of the first S.H.I.E.L.D. opponents at TLC 2012. So fast forward five years, he's the fourth man um, as, you know, the, the, the fourth guy in the S.H.I.E.L.D. Maybe not a S.H.I.E.L.D. member, but an honorary member for one night only to take on Miz, The Bar, and Braun Strowman. I'm sure a Braun Strowman-Ryback match would not light the world on fire. I know, I know you're joking, but hey, Ryback and TLC is the fourth man. Why not? Second question from Captain Sunshine. Why did Kevin Owens versus Shane McMahon last 39 minutes? It didn't feel like 39 minutes. I saw the clock going long. I saw it was like 11.30 by the time the show ended, which is fucking ridiculous. For a B-level pay-per-view, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that some matches got the time. Like, the opener went a long time. The triple threat U.S. title match got a bunch of time, too. And that's great, but... That main event, as good as it was, and I love the story they told, the opener was a lot better, obviously, in ring-wise, but I thought the story the main event told was really, really good. The finish I thought was excellent. Uh, Shane's big bump is also very memorable. It did not need to last 39 minutes. It was a lot better than Shane and Taker from WrestleMania 32, but the reason that match died a death, and no pun intended with The Undertaker being involved, was that it lasted so long when it didn't need to. Because Taker and Shane was not a good mix. Shane and Owens is a lot better because at least Owens can still go. Um, and Shane's like 40, 50 something years old at this point. You put two 50 year olds together like Shane and Undertaker, you're you're, you're bound to get a slow match. Uh, this was a bit better, but I do agree. It did not need to last 39 minutes. I really enjoyed the match. I thought it was a great main event. I just did not think it needed to go that long, especially for a B level pay per view. The, the big four pay per views, other than WrestleMania, should not be four hours. I am dreading Survivor Series in a few weeks uh, next month being four hours long. Last year's show was so dreadfully boring, except for the, not even the main event. I, I was, you guys know I was very, uh, it's very well documented. I was not happy with the Brock Lesnar Goldberg, or Goldberg match lasting 90 seconds. But that Raw and SmackDown match, that final one was great. Um, I just was not a fan of the pay-per-view on the whole, just being four hours. It was just ridiculous. Um, anyway, so a Hell in a Cell pay-per-view should not go until 11.30. Last year's show, which I was at with RJ, went, like, three hours and 20 minutes, too. I got off the air at, like, 11.20, and I had to wait until my next fucking train, because they made me miss the first one, so I was there for, like, an extra hour, which was ridiculous. But, anyway, um, yeah, just a long main event, a good main event, but needlessly long. Next question, is Baron Corbin going to be the next Wade Barrett? You know what? That's not a bad comparison. Wade Barrett was way better on the mic. Probably one of the better mic workers we've had in WWE in some time. But, I don't know. I mean, Wade Barrett got to the main event level. And they really fucked him up when the Nexus kind of went all downhill in the latter half of 2010. And he never really got back to that level. Like, they teased pushing him towards back towards the main event when he won the IC title a few times and all this other stuff. And they could have put the Money in the Bank briefcase on him. They never did. I don't think they see Wade Barrett or Baron Corbin as Wade Barrett, though. I feel like they had their, their point to push Wade Barrett. And they could have pushed him after Nexus, but they never did. Baron Corbin, I feel like they have a lot more invested in him than they ever did Wade Barrett. And Baron Corbin's had a more, much more gradual rise. And I know he won Money in the Bank almost out of nowhere a few months ago before losing it, but... He started out in NXT, as did Wade Barrett, but he didn't jump to the main event scene as soon as he got called up. He had the feuds with Dean Ambrose and Kalisto and Dolph Ziggler and a few others, Sami Zayn, Shinsuke Nakamura, before finally settling on the main event, and they pulled the plug because of some backstage heat that he apparently had. But I think putting him as U.S. champion is a good, is a good fit. Um, I thought the match with Styles and Dillinger at the pay-per-view was really good. I thought the match with Styles on SmackDown was also really, really good. And having him beat Styles clean is also a step in the right direction. Um, but I do think Baron Corbin can be that guy. I think he can be the world champion that Wade Barrett never was. And it also helps that we have the brand split back, too. And Wade Barrett was 
up and coming in WWE. That By that point, the brand split did not matter. I mean, Raw and SmackDown for a time were still two separate shows, and Barrett was on SmackDown for a while too. But by that point, it was pretty much irrelevant, and the brand split did not give our... The death of the brand split did not give many people opportunities. Would Cody Rhodes, would the Ryback, would Wade Barrett have been world champions by now if uh, the brand split was around, you know, four, five, six years ago? Maybe. Wade Barrett, probably. Cody Rhodes is a good chance of it, too. Um, I think because Baron Corbin's on SmackDown, I think benefits him a lot. So I don't see him being the next Wade Barrett. Um, I could see the similarities. I would not be shocked if he was, that he never gets to that main event level. But I think they have a lot more invested in Baron than they ever did Wade Barrett, which is a shame. And I like Baron Corbin, but Wade Barrett could have been that next big thing in 2010-2011. Uh, and he could have been the first English-born WWE World Heavyweight Champion ever um, had they not fucked up his push back then. Brandon A. from YouTube. Push repackage release. Dana Brooke, Tamina, Liv Morgan. So you know me better than anyone that I do not care for any of these women. If I had to choose gun to head, this is what I would do. Push Liv Morgan, and she's not good. She's never going to get any better. That's pretty much evident by this point, but she's probably the best of the three. I would repackage Dana Brooke by putting her back in NXT because I think she's got great charisma. She just is absolutely awful in the ring. But if they put her back down in NXT, give her some more time to season and, and progress and improve, she might be something someday. But you know, I would repackage her. She has no character either. And release Tamina. She's been here for like seven, eight years by this point. Has never gotten any better. I mean, Morgan and Brooke are similar that they've been here for a while. They have yet to improve at all. Brooke's been on the main roster, NXT, for like two, two and a half years. Liv Morgan, two, three years. Tamina, fucking seven and a half years. And we've talked about it here on the show before. I've ranted about how bad Tamina is. She is so bad. She is so bad. And the fact that she's been here for close to a decade and has yet to improve at all is terrible. So I would get rid of Tamina. She has absolutely no worth at the company. I'm sure she's a nice woman, but in the ring, as a character, she's abysmal. And has no reason, has no business being on a roster filled with the likes of Charlotte, Natalia, Becky, Bela, Be Becky Bailey, Sasha, and so on. Push repackage release. Pixar, Marvel, and DC. Movies only for Marvel and DC. <clears throat> Another good question. Um, I love Pixar's movies. Big Pixar guy, Marvel guy. Never been a DC guy, so I'm going to say release DC. Although I did enjoy Wonder Woman, I'm going to say release DC. And I might see Justice League just to say I saw it, but I'm not like, oh my god, I need to see Justice League. I could not care less. I never really even saw the first two Thor movies. I saw the first one. I fell asleep. That's how boring it was to me. Um, but I'm going to see the third one because it looks like a funny buddy cop-esque movie with um with the Hulk involved too. So I'm, I'm probably going to go see that, but I could not really care less of the DC movie. So release DC. Between Marvel and Pixar, I would push Marvel. I love the Marvel movies. Yes, it's kind of getting a bit congested with the amount of movies they're putting out each year, but all of them are, have been good. I've yet to see like a bad Marvel movie, so that's a pretty good track record. Pixar's similar in that they always have good movies. I could not name like one really bad Pixar movie. I didn't see Cars 2. I didn't see Cars 3. I know I've heard, oh my god, those are the worst Pixar movies, and I'm sure even those weren't like terrible. They just were bad compared to Toy Stories and the, the Toy Stories and Monsters, Inc. and Monsters University, The Incredibles, and so on, Finding Nemo. But uh, the more recent Pixar movies, though, I have not really been too into for the most part. Um, I loved Finding Dory. I didn't see Brave. I didn't see Cars 3, like I said. Um, I'll go see Toy Story 4. I don't think it's necessary, but they're making it. Um, Incredibles 2 I'll go see. So, But I haven't seen a lot of the Pixar movies that have been released in the last few years. I heard that um, Inside Out was like amazing. and I, From what I saw, it looked like a good movie, but I never sat down and watched the whole thing. So again, push Marvel, repackage Pixar, and release DC. Push, repackage, release once again. NXT, Lucha, Underground, and Ring of Honor. Wow, that's a good question. Uh, without a doubt, push NXT. I think of the three. Again, gun to head if you told me. And they all air on Wednesdays. Uh, Ring of Honor, like, I don't know what channel they're on. They actually Their episodes actually go up on Mondays on the Fight app. That's how I watch it. It's very accessible. at 7 o'clock p.m. every single Monday. Very reliable. Um, but I think the weekly episodes air. I know they air on like Saturdays on Sinclair Broadcasting, but I don't have Sinclair Broadcasting, so I can't watch them then. Uh, so they all air on Wednesdays. 
if I had to choose one, and I do all watch, I do watch all of those shows at some point or another throughout the week when I have the time. I would watch NXT. It's not always exciting. The weekly episodes aren't always great, but they are guaranteed to be enjoyable more often than not. Lucha Underground as well. Ring of Honor can be hit or miss. They're all great. Um, but NXT is my baby, so to speak. I've been to so many NXT shows. I'm a big NXT guy. They're always bringing in fresh talent. Lucha Underground is great for the storytelling and entering action, but it lost a lot of its magic between seasons one, two, and three. Um, it's not the same show that it was two or three years ago. And it might be on the death of, it might be on the verge of never coming back after season three wraps up. And Ultima Lucha has been great. Parts one and two, as they record this, three airs tonight. But parts one and part two, uh, parts one and two of Ultima Lucha Trace have been fucking amazing. But the show can only go so far, I feel. And they don't tour. Um, so I'm going to have to release Lucha Underground. At least with Ring of Honor, they have the talent there. I know they're never going to get beyond a certain level. That's pretty much evident. That's pretty much evident a lot like TNA, GFW, Impact, whatever. But if you can bring in the right people and Cody Rhodes is a step in the right direction, um, and they can kind of go back to what they once were about a decade ago when they were like the hottest thing on the indie scene, I think you could tweak them a bit to have them become bigger than they are, but not, you know, as big as they should be. So again, push NXT, repackage Ring of Honor, release Lucha Underground. I mean, again, I love Lucha, don't get me wrong, but there, I feel like there's only so far, they can only go so far. With three seasons, they've had a lot of, you know, buzz in social media, they've lost a lot of the magic between those three seasons, between now and when the show first started uh, three years ago. Almost exactly three years ago, actually. But, um... They're not touring. They're not bringing in a lot of new people. They didn't bring in a lot of new people for season three. So I'm sure. And, and if there is a season four, reportedly, if there is even a season four, the production value will be decreased dramatically. So again, release Lucha, um, repackage Ring of Honor, and push NXT. Next question, also from Brandon. Another, my like, computer is giving me these weird-ass updates here. Delete, delete, delete. Okay, next question from Brandon. Uh, push, repackage, release, Jinder Mahal, Kurt Hawkins, and R-Truth. Um, all perennial jobbers, but Push Hawkins, I like Hawkins. I love the whole losing streak thing. Even before that, I liked the guy. I got to meet him twice. Really nice guy. He's not the greatest in-ring worker of all time, but I think he's a pretty passable wrestler, and he's got a good losing streak gimmick going right now, so I would push Hawkins. Repackage R-Truth, I still say that the... Uh, um, the heel turn thing, the, the whole little Jimmy shit that he was doing back in 2011 was the best work he's ever done, hands down. I don't know if he can go back to that when he's in his 40s now, um, and he's really well past that point where they're gonna push him, but it would be cool if they went back to that, albeit briefly, before he eventually retires. Uh, really small. I don't know why he's WWE, ch I mean, I kinda know why he's WWE champion, but to me, he has no worth. The guy looks the par. He's got a great entrance. I love the Singh brothers, but it all goes downhill when that bell rings. His matches are abysmal. His promos are just the same thing every single fucking week. He's got nothing to offer. So all the three, I mean, all like push Mahal, but not not really. Like I could not care less about Mahal. I mean, again, as a mid carder, maybe as a main eventer, as a main event star, absolutely not. So I would release Mahal, repackage our truth, and push Kurt Hawkins. Uh, two more questions from Brandon here. Another push repackage release. Got a lot of them this week from, uh, Brandon. TLC Hell in a Cell Elimination Chamber. So, you didn't specify whether you meant the matches or the pay-per-views. I'm gonna say the pay-per-views. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm gonna say you meant the pay-per-views. So, push TLC and it is kind of, you know, it's all, it's unnecessary to have any one of these three shows. We should not have pay-per-views surrounded around match gimmicks. I think that's just dumb. Unless it's maybe like War Games, which they're bringing back uh, next month, a part of NXT TakeOver. But beyond that, you don't need to have pay-per-view surrounding the TLC match or the Hell in the Cell match. It waters down the concept. That said, of the three, TLC has almost always been good to great to amazing. So I'm going to say push TLC. <sighs> repackage Elimination Chamber. Or I put Repackage Chamber and release Hell in the Cell. Again, if you're talking about the pay-per-view... There has yet to be one really, really good Hell in the Cell pay-per-view. There's been some pretty good ones, but never like a great Hell in the Cell show. Elimination Chamber is kind of the same thing, um, but at least with Elimination Chamber, they only really do one Chamber match. So I would, re I would repackage Chamber release the Hell in the Cell pay-per-view, but if you're talking about the match, 
I would repackage Hell in the Cell, do it rarely, um, and then release the Chamber. Because if we didn't have the Chamber, no worries. We didn't have it for a few years there when they got rid of the show in 2015. So and no one really complained about it. Or they got rid of the show in 2014. They brought they brought it back as a network special in 2015, which was a fucking off. Both chamber matches that night were terrible, and that was the same night we had Cena and Owens won. We had uh, Ambrose and Rollins. So two really really good top main events, but the chamber matches themselves, which the pay per view was named after, were fucking terrible. So I wish you know after that point they didn't bring it back for another like two years because those matches were so bad. But yeah, I would repackage Chamber, release Hell in the Cell, and push TLC. One final question from Brandon here. Bonus question, if you will, in my best Dusty Rhodes voice. Xavier Woods, MVP of Hell in the Cell? I would say so. I would say so. All five guys, or four guys rather, involved in the Usos New Day Hell in the Cell match were fucking great. All four of them had amazing performances. Xavier Woods, more than any other though, with the kendo stick shots that he took... It was unreal, almost disturbing to watch. So yeah, I would say he was the MVP of that Hell in the Cell match. He had a great performance. And I think that when the day comes, which hopefully is not anytime soon, that the New Day has to split, I think Xavier Woods on his own can have a really bright future. The guy's a great wrestler. Um, so I look forward to him breaking out on his own eventually. But yeah, for now, I think, uh, uh, yeah, as the MVP of Hell in the Cell, without a doubt, I thought he had a stellar showing um, in that match on Sunday. Mark S., he's got a couple questions here from Facebook. First one being, which match would you have preferred for the TLC pay-per-view? The current one with Cesaro, Sheamus, The Miz, and Braun Strowman versus The Shield, or the Shield versus Cesaro, Sheamus, and The Miz TLC match, as discussed in your hashtag AskGSM video last week. So, personally, I would prefer... Neither of those two. I would go with the Shield versus the Bar and Strowman and take Miz out and have Miz defend his title against Jason Jordan now or someone else. Um, the thing there is that they already have Miz in the match. They could take him out. I mean, there is one week left before the pay-per-view. They have next Monday's Raw to rectify that if they wanted to. If it is four on three, that's fine. Um, I would personally prefer three on three. I would prefer uh, Sheamus, Cesaro, and The Miz versus The Shield just three-on-three three, as opposed to Strowman being added. But that being said, uh, Strowman, what else do you do with him if you don't have him in the main event? There's no other obvious opponent for him at the pay-per-view if he wasn't um, in the main event. So I prefer three-on-three, three, but having Strowman involved is not a bad thing. It's not like you're putting in, you know, fucking, you know, Elias. I love Elias Sampson, but... You know, you know what I'm saying. Like someone random in that match for no reason, like the Miz Tarage or something. At least it's Strowman. You know he's gonna have great chemistry with all three Shield guys, so that won't be an issue. But um, yeah. So I, I would prefer personally prefer three on three, but four on three is not bad given that lineup. Uh, his next question: What were your top three matches from Hell in a Cell? Easily, not even a question. New Day versus Usos. I think that's definitely in the running for one of the best matches of 2017 for WWE, without a doubt. Uh, the main event, like I said earlier, with Owens and Sheen. And then my third favorite match, or third best match, I would say, was the triple threat for the U.S. title. I thought Corbin, Styles, and Dillinger put together a really, really good triple threat. Um, I enjoyed Corbin versus Styles one-on-one -on -one a bit more on SmackDown on Tuesday. But that triple threat was also really, really good. And uh, with the right finish, too, Corbin picking up his first United States Championship. His next question, if someone from WWE's past came back to challenge Jinder Mahal for the WWE title, who would you like it to be? Nobody. Um, I know you threw out, Mark, the idea of like Hulk Hogan coming back to challenge for the championship. That sounded so terrible. I'm sorry. That was an absolutely awful idea. Um, really anyone, I guess. I mean, all kidding aside, anyone who was to come back and beat Jinder for the title... That's that's all I got to say, because anyone is better than Jinder at this point. Anyone but you, Jinder. Anyone but you, as Bray Wyatt would say about Roman Reigns. And the same can be said about Jinder, because anyone but Roman, anyone but Jinder at this point would be better as WWE champion, including Roman Reigns. Um, I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, I mean, I don't really hate to say it, because I think Roman, he's not bad, but I think people get sick of him as world champion. But he would be a better fit as champion right now than fucking Jinder, because at least you can count on Roman to have like good matches anyway. But... Uh, regardless, I think Kurt Angle, if he wasn't the Raw GM, if he came back and challenged Jinder for the title, the whole USA versus India, even though he's not really from India, um, that whole storyline could be great, but Kurt Angle's on Raw and he's GM and he's not currently wrestling, so that's not going to work. So, again, anyone but Jinder is my answer to that question. 
Who do you think or who do you think will become the next NXT Women's Champion at the next NXT TakeOver and who would you like it to be? So I don't want to spoil anything. If you don't like spoilers, uh, skip ahead a minute or two. But um, I think they currently, they've already revealed who the women will be in the four-way at TakeOver War Games or TakeOver Houston, whatever, contending for the NXT Women's Championship. Kyrie Zane's already been confirmed. That's not a spoiler. I think the remaining three women are Ember Moon, Peyton Royce, maybe Nikki Cross. I forgot who the last woman was. Might be Nikki Cross. It might be someone else. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I would put the belt on Ember. Uh, Kyrie, I think they will, and I think they should. Uh, Kyrie Zane, it would be cool, but I think it's a bit too soon, and it's a four-way, so she doesn't have to be pinned or anything. So having her in the match is great, but she just debuted. Uh, people don't really know her all too well yet. She's got a great fucking phenomenal forearm off the top. Uh, that's, that's AJ Styles, a uh, flying elbow off the top rope, but she's not ready to become champion yet. So at some point down the road, maybe the WrestleMania weekend show or something, but Ember Moon's gone for the belt twice before. She lost both times. They're in her native Texas. Um, it only makes sense to me to put the belt on her there. So I think Ember Moon will and should become the next NXT Women's Champion. She's deserved it. Uh, next question from Jeremy B. from Facebook. Thoughts on Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, plus Eric Rowan and Luke Harper reuniting. Uh, Zayn and Owens, I think, so far has been great. What we saw on Sunday was uh, a welcome change for Sami Zayn, breathing new life not only in a SmackDown, but Sami, Zayn, uh, Sami Zayn's character, obviously, itself. Um, I thought the explanation on Tuesday's show was also really, really good. The logic made sense. The delivery was great. And you never really know. Sami Zayn is a good mic worker, but sometimes his promos feel scripted or they feel forgettable. There haven't been many Sami Zayn promos recently, other than the one he had with Kevin a few weeks ago, that stood out in my memory. But I thought the one that he cut on Tuesday was awesome. And I think Zayn and Owens could be like the next, you know, Jericho where they have great chemistry, and obviously they're really good friends outside the ring, so that's going to add to their chemistry on air. And they've worked well before, they've worked very well together before in the past as rivals, so as tag team partners, it should be great. And I think it was you, Jeremy, that threw out the idea in the past of uh, Zayn and Owens teaming up as a babyface tag team or as a heel tag team. You know what, and I said before, it's not ideal, just because I think Zayn should be like a top babyface right now, but whatever gets him on TV is A-OK -okay with me. Because the guy was doing nothing before. He was barely even on TV. So to have him on TV in a prominent role as Kevin Owens' ally, I'm all for it. So I think so far, so so good. So far, so good in terms of the storyline paying off. I thought they've done a great job with telling that story. I'm interested to see where they go from here. Uh, Sheen will probably be out for the foreseeable future. I know AJ Styles kind of commented on the matter on Talking Smack. A Zayn and Styles feud would be great, but uh, if they don't go that route right now, I think Styles and Mahal might be better uh, just to get the belt off fucking Jinder Mahal, but uh, Zayn and Owens versus The New Day? I know The New Day aren't champions anymore, but that would give New Day something to do. I don't know what it would be for, like what would how that feud would start, but that could be a pretty entertaining program and make New Day more serious. I mean, they kind of already are. They're serious when they need to be, which is great. Um, but anyway, I think it's a, a, a giant step in the right direction for Sami Zayn, for sure. And, uh, Rowan and Harper reuniting. Again, all for it. Maybe not so hot in the gimmick. It looks a bit dumb. It looks a lot like Thor. But aside from that, the fact, again, same thing with Sami. As long as they're on TV, it's better than what they were doing before, which was absolutely nothing. Those guys have not been on TV in months. Actually, the last time we saw them, um, aside from, like, a one-off match here, here and there on SmackDown in, like, July and June... They were feuding. They had a match of the Backlash pay-per-view that Harper won. Um, but you know what? Whatever gets them on the fucking show now again and nowadays, you know, again, I'm all for. Uh, Harper especially, because he's really, really, really good and should not be wasted by doing nothing off TV. And they're like the Bludgeon Brothers or something like that. Maybe that's the 2B that the Fashion Files that Brazongo was referring to, the Fashion Police. So I guess we'll see. But uh, again, not so hot in the gimmick, but I'm glad they're back on TV. And I think you, Jeremy, uh, tweeted this out on Tuesday night during SmackDown, and I could not agree more. SmackDown's tag team, tag team division is looking stacked right now. I know Raw's got a lot of star power between the Hardy Boys, Revival, uh, the Club, the Shield now, um, the Bar. But two of those tag teams I just mentioned are currently out. The Revival, I'm not sure when they're due back. And the Hardy Boys have been out, uh, or will be out for a while, with Jeff injured until like next year. 
So I think SmackDown's division's looking stronger and stronger by the week, especially after the showcase they had on Tuesday. Uh, they have the Hype Bros, who are bound to break up soon, but at least they have the Hype Bros. The Ascension, who mean nothing, but again, it's a tag team. Brizongo, they're slowly getting over. Um, Gable and Benjamin are a great tag team. New Day, Usos, uh, Harper and Rowan, Zayn and Owens, the New Day, like I said. Uh, so they got a lot of great tag teams on SmackDown that we're not really giving a lot of credit to. So even Rusev and Aiden English, if you want to throw them in there too. So I think they have a really good division right now. The makings of a real strong tag team division on SmackDown for the first time probably since the brand split. SmackDown's never really had an all-around great tag team division, but they're slowly getting there with the stories they're telling with New Day, Zayn and Owens, Harper and Rowan coming back, Benjamin and Gable, the Hype Bros, and everyone else. Um, the division is slowly getting to where it should be, which is great to see. The tag team division has always been like a um, an Achilles an Achilles heel for SmackDown. Not the Achilles heel, but like one of their biggest uh, flaws, one of their biggest points where they should improve upon. But I think they're doing really well with who they have right now. At the average grunt, since I seem to like hashtag, uh, since I seem to like to hashtag AskGSMU to rank things a lot these days. Can you rank every WWE pay-per-view that took place in Canada? So, I saw the question. I like the question. Um, I actually did not do my research before. I just saw it here in the document right now. So, you know what? Let's do it live. Fuck it. Let's do it live. So, I'm going to type into Google WWE pay-per-views. List of WWE pay-per-view events. Okay, and I'm just going to type in find on the webpage. Canada. There's been a handful of Canada pay-per-views. Canada. Okay. All right, so there's WrestleMania 6. Uh, it's going to be hard to rank all these. There's like 18 of them, shit. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to rank them all while I'm here. Uh, fuck. I guess we... You know what? I'll just give my thoughts on each one and tell you which one's the best one. WrestleMania 6 was a really good show. I love the main event, obviously. Um, it was a really, really long show, but I would put that towards the top of the list. Very memorable WrestleMania. Um, let's see. Next Canadian WWE pay-per-view. In Your House 4. With the main event of Diesel versus the British Bulldog. I do not remember that at all. I know I watched it earlier this year for WrestleRamp, but I do not remember that whatsoever. Um, In Your House 9, interna International Incident. Uh, main event of Michael, Psycho Sid, and ah Ahmed Johnson versus Vader, British Bulldog, and Owen Hart. That was a really good show. I do remember that main event. That was a really good main event. Um, that was an enjoyable event. Um, In Your House 16, Canadian Stampede. That would uh, probably have to be the best Canadian pay-per-view they ever did. Because it's one of the best pay-per-views WWE ever did. Period. So, without even going any further, and I will, but that one's definitely up there. Uh, In Your House 16. Uh, Canadian Stampede. That main event was unreal. The whole event was fucking great. For a two and a half hour pay-per-view, that was an amazing show. Um, so that would easily be number one. After that, Survivor Series 97. I mean, people only really remember the Montreal Screwjob, but the rest of the card wasn't that good anyway. So that would probably be towards the bottom. Uh, breakdown in your house from September of 98 with a main event of Stone Cold versus Taker versus Kane. Hardly remember anything about it. Very forgettable. Rock Bottom in your house, the main event of Stone Cold versus Taker. Again, I've watched it, but I don't remember anything about it. Uh, so that would be towards the bottom. WrestleMania 18. Um, I enjoyed the show. Not one of the better WrestleManias from that time period. I thought 19, 20, and 17 were better, but still a good show. Um... Excuse me, uh, No Way Out from 2003, Rock and Hogan. I, I remember that being a decent show too. The main event wasn't what their match was at WrestleMania 18, but it was still a pretty good show. Uh, Backlash 04 from Edmonton, Canada, with the main event of Benoit, Triple H, and Shawn Michaels. I do remember that show. I know Average Grunt, who you know asked this question. I know he wanted me to talk about it on Wrestle Rant um, a number of years ago. I think I reviewed it like two years ago. That was a great show. That would for sure be up there as one of the better Canadian pay-per-views WWE ever did. I fucking love that main event. love that show. Um, after that, SummerSlam that year, I forgot, was in, in Canada too with the main event of Benoit and Orton. Uh, I don't remember too much about SummerSlam 04. I remember it being like a decent show and the main event was really good, but I don't remember much about it other than that. But I would probably put that in the middle. It wasn't a bad show and I do remember something about it, but not a ton. Unforgiven 06 was a great show, too. I'd put that towards the top of the main event of a TLC match between Edge and John Cena. That was a really good show. And also Hell in the Cell between DX and the McMahons and Big Show. That was also a uh, pretty stacked card. Uh, Breaking Point 09. 
It was not a good show. I enjoyed parts of it, but it was not a great show whatsoever. Uh, very forgettable, which is the reason probably why they never did a pay-per-view in, uh, in Canada after that for another, like, eight years. So, uh, seven or eight years, but that was not a great show. And then finally, Survivor Series from last year. Uh, I'd probably put that in the middle. It wasn't a terrible show, just very, very boring. Um, but I'd probably put that in the middle too. But to answer your question, best Canadian WWE pay-per-views, easily, without a doubt, um, the Canadian Stampede, 19 or whatever it was, the one from 97, I think, or 90, I don't know, whatever year it was, you know what I'm talking about. The Canadian Stampede pay-per-view. That would be number one, and right behind it would be Backlash 04, and uh, if I had to choose between WrestleMania 6 and 18, I'd probably go with 18, just because 18 wasn't as long as 6, I don't think. It might have been longer, I don't know, but 6 felt really, really long, but uh, just because of all the, like, the meaningless matches in the middle. But I'd put WrestleMania 18 up there, Canadian Stampede, and Backlash 2004. Uh, continuing along here with next question from at RJ underscore Marceau, Mr. Marceau's question from the Twitter machine. Really like this question. Kids always keeping me on my toes here. Uh, he asked, what are the three worst NXT TakeOver matches? Could be just a bad match, didn't live up to the hype, or you just didn't care for it. Um, I didn't go through every TakeOver from like, you know, ever. I just went through the early ones because recently, in like recent years, I cannot think of any ones that come to mind. Any really, really bad match or a match I didn't care too much for. Most TakeOver cards have like a really good stacked card, pretty much dating back to 2015. Um, so I didn't include any matches from then. The three matches I did put, though, um, in no particular order, Enzo More versus Sylvester Lafort from TakeOver Fatal 4-Way um, from September of 2014. Not a good match. That match sucked, I mean, which is not surprising. Enzo's never been too great on his own in the ring. The whole storyline wasn't good. I think the stipulation was that if Lafort lost, whoever lost would have their head shaved. Lafort lost, and they shaved Marcos Luis' head instead. So they didn't even follow through on the stipulation with Lafort. So it was kind of a waste. And the match sucked. Um, Ascension versus Kalisto and El Local. Now this match was so bad, they probably thought Kalisto and El Local would be like what the Lucha Dragons eventually became. Um, El Local was the former Ricardo Rodriguez in a mask. And I was looking forward to seeing what he could do in the ring. But this was not a good showing. This was just not a good match. A lot of botches. Um, I would put Lucha Dragons versus Blake and Murphy on this list as a honorable mention because that wasn't that good of a match either from TakeOver Rival. This Ascension versus Kalisto and El Local match was from TakeOver, just TakeOver, the first TakeOver uh, after Arrival in May of 2014. Just a really sloppy match. And thankfully Kalisto got another shot with, with Sin Cara and they won the titles and whatnot. But El Local did not live up to the hype at all. Um, did not live up to my expectations personally. And then finally, Baron Corbin versus uh, Bull Dempsey. It was like a no-DQ match, and I talked about it a few weeks ago on WrestleRant from TakeOver Rival, I think, the same show as the tag team match I just mentioned between Blake and Murphy and the Lucha Dragons. It, went, it, it wasn't too long, but there were a lot of sloppy spots. The feud wasn't all that good. I like Corbin kind of coming up and picking up wins and whatnot, but... I think he was still babyface by this point. He'd already beaten Dempsey twice. So people had no reason to care about Dempsey. And after this loss, the guy was fucking dead in the water. So not a good match. I'd put that on the list. Ascension versus Kalisto and El Local. Enzo versus Lafort. And as an honorable mention, uh, from also from TakeOver Rival, Blake and Murphy versus the Lucha Dragons. NG Wade underscore my brother Noah. Talked to him for like over an hour on the fucking phone last night. So shout out to Noah. His question was, and he had sent this in last week in just a shout-out or just a uh, reminder. Shout-out to Noah, but also a reminder. If you send in any questions, and Noah's done this before, you got to use the hashtag AskGSM, but you got to tweet them to me. That's why I put in the tweets, tweet me questions using the hashtag. Like, tweet me, or, you know, you can either tweet me or just reply to the tweet that I put up on Tuesdays. Uh, that's the easiest way for me to find it. I don't search up the hashtag on Twitter. It's a lot easier if you just are in my mentions. Anyway, so his question was, if you could have stood in Gorilla for any moment in wrestling history, what would it be and why? That's an awesome question. I'm not sure. Oh, that's a fucking hard one to say. I mean, Montreal Screwjob would be interesting just to see the reactions of the people coming from the back. I would not want to get hit in the face by Bret Hart. Um, Montreal Screwjob would have to be one. 
Uh, CM Punk winning the WWE title in Chicago. I've said that before. I wish I could have been there for that in Money in the Bank 2011. I know Noah does not like that answer because he's not a CM Punk fan. But that one, um, yeah, it, really any one of those. I mean, Montreal Screwjob or that one are the only two that come to mind. I mean, any real moment in history would be great. But uh, for, for two very different reasons, both for like anger for the Montreal Screwjob to see the reactions of people coming back out. And then being in Gorilla for when Punk won the WWE title and hearing that reaction from the back would also be surreal. So either of those two would be real interesting to have been a part of Gorilla for. At E13A from Twitter, have you seen the Ambrose and Rollins rewatching their Hell in a Cell 2014 match video? So WWE put up a video last week, I think on Friday or Thursday, whenever it might have been. It was a video of Ambrose and Rollins just sitting down on a couch rewatching parts of their Hell in a Cell match from three years ago. I did see that, and I thought it was really, really good. It went, not like viral, but um, it blew up. It got like over a million views, which is rare for a video that has nothing to do with like Raw or SmackDown or whatever, or pay-per-view. It was just the random WWE digital video they put up, and it blew up. And I'm pretty sure it got a lot of great feedback, too. It was interesting to see now that Ambrose and Rollins are like friends again in storyline, so for them to go back and watch that match back and kind of give thoughts on it and behind-the-scenes look at what was going on during the match was real interesting. So, yeah, I did see the video. It was real good. I wish WWE would do more of that kind of stuff in the future. Um, and they have before. I know they did that with Rollins and Sting not long ago either with their Clash of Champions match or uh, Night of Champions match from 2015. They did it then too. So um, I wish they would do more of that in the future as well. At Scarlet one from Twitter, have you heard about Neville possibly leaving WWE? Yes, I have. I tweeted about it last night that it sounds like Austin Aries all over again. Now, I don't want to uh, speak. What, what, I don't want people to think that what I'm saying is the gospel truth or anything like that. But we're just going kind of going off reports that it was re that was first reported last night right before SmackDown that Neville walked out before Raw on Monday night, uh, which is why they changed the match to Kalisto. Now. I find it very hard to believe they would have given the belt to Neville or have given Neville his rematch in the main event of Raw. It's it's very weird because they transitioned very clearly before he walked out this past week, quote-unquote. It was very clear they transitioned out of Neville, Neville out of the title picture the week before when he was in the main event segment of Raw, but he didn't do anything. Uh, it was Kalisto who came out and laid out Enzo Amore, not Neville. Neville wasn't even on 205 Live that week, so... I find it very hard to believe that he was going to be in the main event uh, at all, let alone win or lose regardless. So a lot of what's being reported, I find hard to believe. I, apparently there is some truth to him walking out, but it might be for a different reason. I'm not exactly sure. I did find it weird that he wasn't in the main event this week. Um, so I'm after, you know, having been there for the past two weeks. So I do believe there is some truth to him leaving before Raw, but I find it hard to believe that he was going to be in the main event and lose or even win. I mean, they already did the thing a few weeks ago where he beat up Enzo, therefore forfeiting his title rematch. So why would you go back and give him a championship rematch? You know what I mean? They already kind of wrapped up that feud a few weeks ago, and they moved into Kalisto. Giving Kalisto the big win on Raw made sense. It was Eddie Guerrero's birthday, and they wanted to have a big moment to close out the show. People were responsive. A complete 180 from the week before. A complete 180 from the week before where Kalisto came out and got, like, no reaction. Um... So yeah, I thought it was interesting they did that, um, that they did that with Kalisto and not Neville, but it didn't surprise me. And now they can give, you know, Enzo his rematch of the pay-per-view at TLC in a few weeks, he could probably win it back there. I'm not sure what they're doing with the division, but to answer your question about Neville, um, yes, I did hear about it. I, it. Not that it wouldn't surprise me if he left. Um, I mean, I, I guess he could have quit, but it, I just find it very hard to believe. I mean, again... It could be a lot like the Austin Aries situation where he says, fuck this, I'm quitting because if you know I'm not going to be in the heavyweight division, why should I stick around? Because he's been the king of the Cruiserweights. That was an awful accent, by the way. For like so long now that you take the title off him and they just do nothing with him in the division. It would make sense for them to transition him out of the division, back into the heavyweights, and do something with him there at the IC or US title level. And to have him just wither away the Cruiserweight division just makes no sense to me. Which is why Austin Aries felt that... I mean, again, it, it's weird because Aries has been out of WWE now for like over three months. Yet he has yet to really comment on why he left. There's only real speculation as to why. And I think that 90 day no compete clause is already up too. So he can say whatever the hell he wants, I'm pretty sure, about why he left. But Which leads me to believe he hasn't like 
you know, uh, argued about anything that was reported a few months ago that he reached the point in the division where he lost three times to the champion, who then lost to Enzo in one match, but that's neither here nor there. Um, he lost three times to the champion, and then he was going to be in a program with fucking Tony Nese of all people after that. And he probably requested, hey, I want to be a part of the heavyweights. They said no, so he left. And if the same thing happened to Neville, that's a massive shame. How weird would it be that if the two guys that competed for the Cruiserweight Championship at WrestleMania would be gone from the company six months later? Both Aries and Neville. That would be just unreal. But Neville is just an amazing wrestler. The guy's really reinvented himself, reinvented himself this year. So for him to leave would be a shame. But again, it's hard to blame the guy. 205 Live is the fucking kiss of death. And Enzo Mora was already over before he got there, so that's a bit different. But once you go to 205 Live, there's no leaving. Uh, no one yet in the, in the year the division has been around has been a part of the Cruiserweight division and has then left. Other than Sin Cara, but he was in the part of the division for like fucking a month. Hardly counts. Beyond, And he's not even on TV right now. Uh, beyond him, no one has joined the division and then left to go on to do other things in like NXT or you know, the main roster or whatever. So, I wouldn't blame him if he left because he is one of the best wrestlers in the world today. But, and he deserves a lot better. And I guess we'll find out in the days and, and hours ahead, possibly later on, as, as early as later today. I would hope so because there's been a lot of speculation that he's gone. And I hope he isn't. But, if he's going to just continue to flounder in the Cruiserweight division and not be brought up to where he belongs in the Heavyweight division on Raw or SmackDown, he might as well leave. Is Matt Hardy able to be a single star, emphasis on the next part, completely on his own? Yes, he is. It's not a matter of whether he can, it's a matter of whether they, he will be. It's a matter of whether WWE wants him to be a, a completely a singles act, a total singles act, and if they give him the creative you know, freedom to do whatever he wants, maybe not 100% creative freedom, but if they let him do some sort of form of broken on his own, then yes, he can be a successful single star. He has been in the past. You know, he was a United States champion, an ECW champion. He got a lot of success on his own in TNA. He doesn't always need to be with Jeff Hardy. That time was coming anyway. Whether it was, you know, in a few months or six months from now, whether he was going to turn on Matt Hardy or uh, that Matt Hardy was going to turn on him, I think this might be a blessing in disguise. So far, they have yet to do anything with Matt Hardy on his own. But, um... He got beaten by Braun Strowman on Monday, which he got a lot more offense in than I thought he would, which was cool. And he deserves a lot better than whatever they're doing with him right now, um, which is nothing. But if they want to push him, they can. I mean, the guy is 100% able to, you know, survive on his own if they wanted him to. It's just a matter of giving him something creatively meaningful to do. And so far, they have not done that. So I do believe he can do well on his own. It's just a matter of giving him a program, whether it be with... And I tweeted this out yesterday... You know, Bray Wyatt, a broken Matt versus Bray Wyatt feud might have been something. Even a year ago when Bray Wyatt, even then he didn't mean anything. But now he could not mean any less than he has ever had. Um, just because the whole Sister Abigail bullshit and the fucking he might be Sister Abigail. Good God, that is atrocious. I don't know if I talked about that last week here on the show. I think I recorded the show before that report came out. But that is awful. Oh my God, that sounds atrocious. The fact that Bray Wyatt would come out wearing a wig, acting like he was Sister Abigail is the biggest slap in the face to anyone who has ever been a fan of Bray Wyatt, which is dwindling fast. A lot of people are losing faith in Bray Wyatt, not because of what he's capable of, but because of what they're having him do. Um, but anyway, a Matt Hardy, Bray Wyatt feud, you know what? At least it gives Matt something to do, you know, on his own. Once he wraps up the feud of Finn Balor, Bray Wyatt, that is. So we'll see. But I think Bray, I think Matt Hardy on his own could be interesting, whether it be as a heel or a face or whatever. It's better than having him fucking work main event for the next six months. He's a big enough name where he can survive on his own. He's not a Dash Wilder. He can do shit on his own if they want him to. It's just a matter of giving him something to do to begin with is the real key there. Next question, also from Scarlet One. Did you know WWE 2K18 has five separate versions of Sting? I didn't know there were five separate versions of Sting to begin with. Um, I know they had a few in like a few other games, like they had Surfer Sting... WCW Crow Sting, and then, like, current day, modern day Sting. What are what other Stings are there? You know, the WWE Sting, Crow Sting, Surfer Sting. What else? I mean, I'm sure there's other versions. You said they have five. Um, that That's a bit ridiculous. I know there was a game a few years ago. It might have been WWE 13, where they had, like, three different Triple Hs. Like, 
who cares? Just choose one, have it be a different costume, just not a different wrestler. That's kind of silly to me. Taking up a spot on the roster for three different versions of a character, to me, is kind of dumb. Even if it's someone like Sting, who I like a lot, but eh, five separate versions. How many people will be playing a surfer Sting? Like, really? Like, that part isn't necessary. Have it be a different costume, and then move on. Uh, I'll probably get the game. The game looks really promising. The roster looks fucking stacked. But stuff like that is just unnecessary. Uh, when do you think Kevin Owens will turn on Sami Zayn again? Uh, good question. Honestly, I don't think it... You know what would be really cool? That if it wasn't Owens who turned on Zayn, but the other way around. Like, after Owens turned on Zayn when they were both baby faces back in NXT when Owens first debuted three years ago, it would be so fucking amazing, which people have brought up and pitched the idea for, and I think it's a great idea. Having Zayn eventually reveal that him aligning with Kevin Owens was merely to get him back to relevancy, back to the main event scene. And then maybe Owens wins the world title at some point in the next few months. And then Zayn turns on him. It's kind of a lot like what we saw with Bray Wyatt and Orton, mind you, but just ten times better, given who's involved. Um, but then Zayn turns on Owens, and he reveals, it's been a ruse the whole time, it was a ruse, I used you, whatever, and I'm doing it for the good, I want to win this my way. And then he beats Owens for the title at WrestleMania. That would be fucking amazing, it's not going to happen. But um, I do think, regardless of what the end result of this storyline is, I do think it's going to be Sami Zayn turning his back on Kevin Owens. Having Owens turn on Zayn again, this time as a heel, eh, been there, done that. I think it'd be cool if they kind of uh, switched it up. When they were both baby faces, at least for a night, and then Owens turned on him, this time you have both guys as heels, and then Z and then Sami Zayn turns on KO. I think that would be really, really cool. Uh, when that would be, hopefully not anytime soon, maybe uh, right before WrestleMania, but having an owens Zayn match at WrestleMania for a significant title, if not the WWE title, would be fucking amazing. I don't think it's going to happen, but it would be a great story to tell. Uh, and I do want to say this real quick too. Owens and Zayn, along with The Shield are some of the two two of the best stories that WWE has told in the past five to ten years. Like, the fact that Owens and Zayn are constantly intertwined with each other's feuds and whatnot over the last three years, and also beyond WWE, is amazing. And their matches never feel old, and now they're together and they're trying something new. The Shield, the same thing. They were together for almost two years. They broke up, had every feud imaginable, with uh, Reigns and Ambrose having a match, Rollins and Reigns... Rollins and Ambrose, of course, a million times. And uh, they finally come back together as baby faces. Like, the whole story of The Shield and also of KO and Zayn, we give WWE a lot of shit for stuff that they do and not doing stuff right. But uh, I thought what they did with those guys, between Owens and Zayn and The Shield, what they have done with those guys in the last three to five years has been incredible storytelling. So that should not go unnoticed. Uh, their next question, where do you think the Cruiserweight division will be by the end of the year? A bit better than it was at the end of last year, which was completely non-existent for the most part. I mean, it was Rich Swan, Kendrick, and TJP fighting over the title constantly. Like, they had good matches, but no one fucking cared. And then that was when Neville debuted and the division kind of uh, received a bit of a boost. But after everyone they brought in to help save this division, from Neville to Aries to Enzo to Kalisto, now, again, like I said, the match they had in the main event Raw this week was good. And they had the title change, and they closed out Raw for the first time ever in a match. That's great, but where do they go from here? It's all about the fallout. It's not about moments. It's about carrying and maintaining maintaining this momentum going forward. Can they capitalize off the moment they created at the end of Raw this week? 205 Live was alright on Tuesday, but are what they doing on Raw translating to viewers on, on 205 Live? That's the real question. Is any of what they're doing right now with Kalisto and Neville or what they were doing with Neville and Enzo Amore translating to people watching the show? I'm not sure. And if it is, great. If it's not, then what they're doing is not working. It's better than what they were doing six months ago. And I love Neville and he was a great champion, but no one cared about the matches or the feuds or anything about 205 Live. At least with Enzo, the guy's way better off as a heel. Um, I'm not a big Enzo fan on his own nowadays, but you know what? As a heel, he's great. And he can carry himself on the mic. And uh, he can be carried in the ring by the likes of Neville. And, uh, I mean, No Mercy was uh, not a great example because that match sucked. But the Kalista match on Raw this week was pretty decent. So, I'm not sure where they go from here. Um, uh, hopefully the Cruiserweight division is still around. I would assume that by having him close out Raw three weeks in a row means they're not giving up on this experiment anytime soon. 
But um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If they keep on having people reach the top and then fall down to the bottom, it's it's not a good system. It should be like NXT, where you get to the top, you win the title, or even if you don't, you move on. Akira Tozawa has no business anymore being in 205 Live. He should be teaming with Apollo Crews on Raw. Give Apollo Crews something to do. You know what I mean? That's another good tag team to have on Raw. Um, just having him go for the belt, win the belt, lose the belt, and then go on to do nothing. I know he's feuding with, like, Drew Gulak right now. Who the fuck cares? Um, it's just a waste. And it really ruins any momentum that he had when he was at the top of the division. Neville, same thing. That's what they should have done with Austin Aries. You win the belt, you go for the belt, you lose, and then you move on to Raw or SmackDown. And you know they have a, a surplus of talent for the cruiserweights. They could always call up people from NXT, and they also have people all around the world that they could put in the cruiserweight division too. That they could always sign at the just on a whim to put in there. So it's not they have a it's not like they have a shortage of cruiserweight talent. There's also people they're not even using, like fucking Graham Metallic. Where was he on Monday? If there's anyone that should quit the WWE? It's not Neville. It's fucking Graham Metallic. This guy's been a part of the division since day one, and they have yet to really do anything with him at all. And he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. That's what bothers me. Neville, I mean, the fact that he had the title for like 10 months and is quitting less than a month after he dropped the belt, if he is indeed quitting, I like Neville and I don't blame him, but it's kind of fucking sad. Like, at least weed it out for a little while and then quit. Maybe he has a good idea of where he's headed, but if anyone should be quitting, it's fucking Grand Metallic. I mean, the guy's been here for a year and for the better part of that year, he hasn't even been on TV. So, I think he has a better claim for being let go than fucking Neville is, but that's just me. Final question from that Hardy DX fan from Twitter, uh, my good friend Ross. His question was, do you think Armageddon 2004 was an underrated pay-per-view? So I didn't remember anything from that show when you brought it up. I had to go back and look at it. So here's the card for the show, and you can tell me if it's underrated. I don't think so, but here's the card real quick. Rob Van Dam and Rey Mysterio defended their WWE Tag Team titles against Rene Dupree and Kenzo Suzuki. Kurt Angle beat Santa Claus. Okay. Uh, Daniel Pewter beat Mike Mazan in The Miz in when they were part of Tough Enough in a Dixie dogfight. The Bajan Brothers beat Hardcore Holly and Charlie Haas. John Cena beat Jesus in a street fight for the U.S. title. Uh, Dawn Marie beat Miss Jackie in a singles match where Charlie Haas was the special guest referee. Big Show beat Mark Jindrake in a handicap match. Or Mark Jindrake, Luther Reigns, and Kurt Angle. Funaki beat Spike Dudley to win the uh, Cruiserweight Championship. And JBL beat Eddie Guerrero, The Undertaker, and Booker T in a four-way to retain the WWE Championship. So, on paper, it doesn't sound like a good show. Um, it sounds like a pretty forgettable show to me. No one match out of any of those stands out whatsoever. I know I watched the show and I reviewed it for WrestleRant. Maybe I was much more kind to it in my review after watching it, but looking back at this card, I do not remember anything about the show except for the main event. So, I wouldn't call it an underrated show based off what I'm looking at right now. And again, it's not a matter of like, oh, I haven't seen it. No, I have seen it. I just don't remember anything about it. And I watch a lot of wrestling. I understand that. But you would think that with this many matches, at least one would stand out. Another main event was all right. But beyond that, nothing on the show looks like it was any good at all. So I don't think it was that um, memorable or even underrated of a show. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe you enjoy the show more than I did. But it does not look like an underrated show in my book. Anyway, guys, that is it for episode 202 of Hashtag Ask Sam here today. Thank you guys, as always, for checking out the show, listening, uh, watching the video, whatever, and for sending in your questions. If you want to do so, be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. Last but certainly not least, drop a comment on this very video in the comment section down below. I'll include your question in next week's edition. All that being said, guys, one more time, be sure to check out Wrestle Rant Radio tomorrow for my exclusive interview with WWE superstar and the aforementioned Sin Cara, former NXT Tag Team Champion. Talking Reebok Classic, Foot Locker, uh, their partnership with WWE and their, their new uh, new line of footwear. Talking Eddie Guerrero, the Cruiserweight Division, being a, native, being a Texan, being a, a native from Texas and whatnot. Uh, so much to talk about with Sin Cara coming up tomorrow on the four-year anniversary show of Wrestle Rant Radio. So that being said, guys, be sure to like this video, drop a comment, like I said earlier, subscribe to the channel for more daily content, and also share the video. All that stuff is amazingly appreciated. 
Thank you guys, as always, for checking out Hashtag AskGSM. We'll be back next Wednesday with another all-new episode. Until then, guys, I'm Graham GSM Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.